Good afternoon. You're very polite as well. So I'm Nick Bishop and I work with a business called Solution Focused. We're a learning and development consultancy and we specialize in what we call behavioral change. So we're trying to change people's behavior so they can become the best version of themselves. Because it's how you believe in yourself that determines how successful you are in whatever you do. Now, never ask someone to do a two-line bio of you. It's quite hard. If someone says, just put two lines on the first slide about yourself. So I asked someone in the office to do it, and that is what they wrote. So if I can just explain. Finding solutions for all. Well, actually, there's seven billion people on this earth, so you're never alone. Never think when you have a problem you can't ask someone. Imagine the problem you have. Is there never going to be someone on the earth who's not had the same problem? Seven billion people. So there is some relevance in this anyway. Expert wine drinker, well there's two parts to that. I don't mind admitting to be an expert wine drinker, but I'm not an expert on wine. There is a difference there. And it says mad athlete, and that actually links into part of what we're talking about today. When I was, I won't say when, how old I was, sorry, I'll say in 1981, it's a better way to, to say something. In 1981, I ran from London to Manchester in five days, two marathons a day for five days. But the point being, I had no fear of failure. I wasn't conditioned. I didn't think what I could and couldn't do. Now, if you asked me to do that today, I'd say you are off your, you know, that's the one. Because, but when I was younger, I had no fear of failure, no conditioning. So much of what we talk about today is all about that. So the topic, understand your mind to achieve peak performance. We're going to be talking about our thinking how it affects our emotions, the actions we take, and what we hope, the results we get. Results can be good, they can be bad, but a lot comes down to our thinking. Are we born lucky? Is there a lucky gene? What about people who win the lottery? They're always lucky, I told you so. Are people born lucky? Of course they're not. So there has to be more than that. Is there a gene that gives people ability or talent? Probably not. What actually people say, you've probably heard the, the adage, it's 90% attitude and 10% aptitude. And there's a lot of focus going on in America at the moment, which is actually saying that to be the best version of you at the biggest things in your life takes 10,000 hours of effort. We're not talking about making a ham sandwich. We're talking about significant things to be the best you can be. Isn't down to genes or perceived talent it's down to hours of effort. And the figure coming out is 10,000 hours of effort. I've often, before I even read that study in America, I'd often watched darts on television. And I actually thought, do you know what? If I sat at home all day long for a couple of years throwing darts, I honestly believe I could be world class. I don't think it's that hard. It's hours of effort that go into it. So that's where the 10,000 hours comes in. We have in our business something called the tear cycle. And I'm going to take this in reverse, because often what we do, the results that we have to produce for our business are expected. The actions that we take are normally given to us. The emotions, how we feel about things in life and the business are often not considered. And they assume, or people assume, our thinking. I want to turn it back the way it should be, is this way. Our thinking will affect our emotions. Positive thoughts, positive emotions. And then the actions we take, and then the results we get. Harvard University in the 1950s carried out some research and came up with two management styles. One was called COP, Control, Organize, Predict. Very military, very factory, very armed forces. There was one also called ACE, Align, Challenge and Evaluate. Align people's thinking together, challenge in an open office environment, evaluate the best way forward, and use that as a method. They then found out that 90% of the companies adopting the, the ACE environment had better results on the American Dow Jones than the other companies. It was the best way to work involving people. Our thinking is so powerful that we can conjure up anything in our mind. Is there anyone here that isn't mad keen on going to the dentist? 
You're okay, are you? Well, there are some people, by the way, that don't like it. So just picture this for a moment. The day before they go to the dentist, they're at home. They're thinking about the dentist. They're thinking about the drill. They're thinking about that chair in the dentist's room. And their mind, oh, I don't fancy this one bit. They're starting to get the same feelings as if they're in the dentist's chair the next day. So the mind is producing those feelings and emotions just because of the power of our thinking. Think about it another way, in a more positive light. A room full of ladies, but I have to be very careful in the modern world we live in. You're going out tomorrow night on a date with a hunky bloke. It could be a hunky lady, it could be anything, anyone. But the point is, you're getting excited. You start to think about tomorrow's date. Oh, I'm looking forward to it, oh yeah. So we're creating an image in our own mind. We're not there, but the mind is creating that picture. So the mind is so powerful, it can do so many things for us. And a lot starts with our self-talk. Helpful self-talk. How often do you think we have helpful self-talk compared to hindering? I don't fancy this one bit. What do you think? Which is more, which do we use more? Positive, negative? Indeed. We have 70,000 thoughts go through our mind all day. And our self-image, our self-talk drives the image that we have of ourselves. And it's the image we have of ourselves that actually drives our end performance because we cannot perform to a greater level than the image that we have of ourselves. When you go home on a Friday night, I still sort of, it's like old money this, I do Monday to Friday nine to five still, I know it's 24 seven very much in the world now, but call it Monday, Friday nine to five. We go home, you've probably been brilliant for 95% of the week, done outstanding work. What do we do? You're on the tube, you're in the car, you're on the bus, you're on the train. We beat ourselves up about the 5% that didn't go according to plan. We look back on the week and say, oh, I can't believe I didn't do that. I can't. We don't pat ourselves on the back for the 95% that was outstanding. So we drive our own self-talk in a negative way. And then we come to our conditioning, which I touched on earlier, and I'm going to tell you in more detail. So our self-talk is one of the biggest things in how we perceive ourselves. We live our life on our perceptions of reality, not reality itself. It's how we see ourselves in the outside world. You probably know this young man, sadly dead now. He called himself the greatest. Do you know what? He, from the age of seven, 70 times a day, said, I am the greatest. 70 times a day from the age of seven. What he also did, he started to predict what round he was going to win in. So he'd say, right hand jive, down in five. And more often than not, he was right. So what is he doing? He's, he's, his self-talk is such that his affirmations, which we'll talk about too, the way he sees the vision he has of himself is convincing himself how great he is. And you wouldn't dispute the fact he was a pretty awesome fighter. Which takes us on to what we call affirmations. Affirmations are very positive statements about ourselves, always in the present tense. Powerful words, powerful statements, doing words, descriptive words, written in the present tense. And the, way, the reason we do present tense is it it's makes you think it's here and now, not in the future. Doing it in the here and now. And it's about I, I. So for example, it could be that I'm giving a presentation. There's a hundred people in the room, I wish. They're loving what I'm talking about. The slides look great. I'm really enjoying this. So what it's doing to me, and I do this, say, a month before every day, and it starts to create a picture of what it's going to be like. Because all we, we've already said we live our lives on our perception of reality, not the truth. Okay? So it's so important. I work with a lady. She was chief exec at um, Hobbycraft. And she was running in the Dublin Marathon. So what we did for Catriona, Catriona Marshall, her name, was I found a copy of the Dublin Gazette, the paper, what have you, and I created an image. What are you thinking? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I got a picture and a headline, Catriona Marshall smashes her target, finishes the Dublin Marathon in three hours 43, and I posed a picture of her in the headline. And she put it on a picture frame on her office desk. She then created affirmations 
And her affirmation, we got a picture of the finish line so she could picture it. So she was something like, I'm finishing the Dublin Marathon. I look into the crowd. My husband, Mike, is there. He waves. I wave back. It's showing, it's showing three hours 43. I feel fantastic. So the affirmation is a powerful doing statement you create in the present tense about something that will happen in the future. But remember, our self-talk, positive, negative belief systems, we live our lives on what we believe, not necessarily what is the reality of the situation. Psychology tells us, do that twice daily for 30 days and the belief becomes ingrained in you. Then we come on to the brain. My goodness, how long have you got? The brain is the most powerful tool that we have. I'll just explain these very briefly, then I'll go into more detail. We have more neurons in the brain than grains of sand on the planet. We make pathways in our brain which are electrochemical. Same thought, same pathway. But like everything, we need to use the brain and the pathways like a muscle. So we have to create our own success pathways, and this is how we do it. We have in the brain something called dendrites. Dendrites are simply the channels, the pathways, that transmit signals in our brain. We then go on to the law of electricity, electrochemicals. Our thoughts will always travel down the thickest dendrites. If we don't use certain, certain thoughts, they go down the different dendrites. We have negative, positive dendrites. The more we think about ourselves in a very positive manner, the more we talk, our self-talk, we have affirmations, we start to believe more in ourselves, the thoughts go through the positive dendrite. And what does that do? It gets thicker and thicker, and the thoughts travel faster and faster. Negative dendrites are the reverse. The more we talk about ourselves in a way which is, I'll never get that done, I'm useless at this, I, oh, I, I, that's not gonna happen either. They travel down our negative dendrites. And of course, the more we do that, the thicker they get, the faster the current goes, the more we believe it. So that is why self-talk is so important because the more we speak in a positive manner about ourselves, our self-talk, our belief systems, we thicken the positive dendrite and we reduce the negative dendrite. And then, like any other muscle, if I go to the gym regularly, exercise, pump iron, my arm gets more muscular, just like our positive dendrites. The more I do that, the negative dendrites disappear. But once I stop going to the gym, stop using the positive dendrites, positive thoughts, the muscle disappears again. That is a, a, a medical way of explaining to you why self-talk is so important. Our belief systems are connected by dendrites. So, so important. We also, we have two, two systems in our brain, our conscious mind and our subconscious. Our conscious is what we're doing here, talking to you, listening to you, hearing you, watching things happen, etc., etc. We then have our subconscious, and our subconscious is actually just a filing system. Everything we do in life, everything we notice on the outside world is filed in our subconscious. So the reason we behave as creatures of habit is that every time anything happens, every time we make a decision, our conscious mind investigates our subconscious. What do I do in this situation? Now the subconscious is actually like a taxi driver. The taxi driver says, where to, gov? You tell him that he just takes you there. It's the same with our subconscious and our conscious. The conscious investigates the subconscious. This is the situation, what do I do? Feeds the reaction to the conscious and we behave according to our perception of reality because we stored it in that filing cabinet, what we do in certain situations. So unless we change our behaviors and our belief systems, we'll always behave that way. That's why it's so, so important. I mentioned conditioning to you, and this sums it up really, really well. Our conditioning is very much about what we think about ourselves, where we get our thinking from, what influences us, all those kinds of things. They do say, by the way, if you suffer from depression, don't read newspapers, because it feeds our conditioning. Our conditioning could be managers, parents, teachers, 
a great story I read was about a lady who lived in a, a quite a rough council estate. Now, my wife came from a council estate, so I have no issue at all with that. The point being, a black lady with six children, um, she didn't have a husband, she's widowed. Now, society might say her lot was that in life. Every one of her six children became barristers. But had she thought this, self-limiting beliefs, negative mental attitude become lousy emotions and we have worse behavior behavior being performance whereas on the other side we have inspiring beliefs which drives our positive mental attitude with great emotions and then we have peak performance so we have to make sure we have the biggest input here we are ultimately the people that make this happen so we have to start with our own conditioning and changing the way we think about ourselves. Another point there, we have something called gestalt. And it's very difficult to try and deliver peak performance when you're here. Because what it does, it stresses you. Well, oh, I better try my best at this. You can't suddenly turn up one day and say, I'm gonna be great today. Because you, being great is something that you prepare for days, weeks, etc. So it's very difficult to try and be great when actually your negative thought chain is taking down this channel. Very, very difficult. That's why our thoughts are so important. I'm gonna give you a great example of this about a potato farmer called Cliff Young in Australia. He lived with his mum and he was 61 years old when this happened. But he was out one day, he herded sheep, uh, plowed the potatoes over a 20,000 acre farm. One day his pal said to him, Hi Cliff mate, there's a running race, Sydney to Melbourne, 500 miles. So he thought, well, I run around my farm all day, I'm not going to do any harm. This is a bit like me in 1981, by the way, no fear of failure, well, no problem, I'll just do it. So he just did it. So he turned up on the start line and all the other runners were there in nice Nike kit, Adidas, Asics, you know, all the fancy Puma, all the nice gear. And this is how he turned up for the race. So people said to him, who's your coach, mate? He said, me ma'am. Anyway, the gun goes and off they go. And all these perceived, I'll use the word perceived, elite runners go running off for 12, 14 hours, and then they stop. And they, they, they sleep in a um, pre-provided tents overnight, take on board food, etc. What does Cliff Young do? He ran for 20 hours. So when they've all stopped, he kept on running. Day two, they overtake him. Same story goes on. End of day two, he overtakes them. He keeps running for 22, 23 hours. He doesn't always get sleep at home around his farm, so what's the big deal? To cut a long story short, by about day three, and you can Google this, by the way, it's not a big fib, the Australian press were starting to take note of this. This became headline news in Australia and headline news on television. To cut a long story short, he won the race. <laughs> now, the following year, what do you think happened? He did the same thing. No. Nope. It didn't happen because the so-called perceived athletes, their conditioning was changed. They suddenly thought, God, I don't have to rest as much as I thought. I don't have to do this. Because he had no preconceived ideas, his conditioning was such that I'll just do it. No fear of failure. He showed what was possible. So then we're talking in the realms of Sir Roger Bannister, 1954 first four minute mile. Now, did you realize that when he ran the four minute mile in 1954, medics had always said that to run a sub four minute mile was medically and physically impossible. Mm -hmm. To run sub four minutes, the blood in the brain would combust. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine running along and the clock being 354, 355, three, I'll think I'll slow down. I don't want this blood combusting. When he did his sub four minute mile in 1954, why do you think 38 more people did it in the rest of the year before the Christmas? Because he proved what was possible. So our conditioning, our belief systems drive what we believe is actually possible, which goes back to me being um, 21, running the Manchester Marathon in 1981, the first Manchester Marathon, being asked by a charity, how could I raise money? Deciding to run from London to Manchester because I had no conditioning, I had no fear of failure. Well, what's, what's the worst thing that's gonna happen? It's a bit like that. Not quite as extreme, I grant you, but it's the same principle.
the same principle. People tell, ask me sometimes, I want to be motivated. How do I motivate myself? You can actually only be motivated if you've got very strong goals that you believe in with a vengeance and a passion. You can't just turn up for work today, oh God, I need to be motivated. The only way to motivate yourself is to have powerful goals that you believe in with a passion and a vengeance. And then they've actually got to be relevant to you, something you believe in with a passion. Very, very important that, having goals that you believe in totally. This is an interesting guy. John de Boer was an Australian swimmer. He wasn't an Australian swimmer. He was an American swimmer. Doesn't matter though. American swimmer. And he was watching the 1972 Olympics. And they were in Zurich. And he's incredibly engaged when he watched them. He was a good collegiate swimmer at the time, but no more than that. But he saw Mark Spitz win five four, six Olympic gold medals. And he thought, I want to be that person. The problem he had was he was probably a second or two below the time he needed to be for the, to get into the Australian team. Okay. But he worked out that all he had to do was improve by one fifth of the blink of an eyelid for every hour of training he could commit to. So when you break it down like that, I think, well, all I've got to do is improve by one-fifth of a blink of an eyelid for every hour of training. He broke it down into such small details, it seemed possible. People sometimes say, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is in bite-sized chunks. So it's the same as that. So we fast forward now, four years later, he was made captain of the Australian team. He went on to win three gold medals, two in world record pace. The point being, he broke down his goals into minuscule amounts, which then became very achievable. Remember the slide, relevant, could he do it? We have two forms of motivation as well, towards and away from motivation. Towards, when we set goals, like on the previous slide, is all about something that drives you passionately. The goal is so important, it motivates you. Away from motivation is where the situation we're more concerned about not doing something than doing something. So a pal of mine was training for a half marathon and he couldn't get out of bed. He, oh, I'm struggling to get motivated to run this half marathon. His towards motivation to do it wasn't very strong. So what he did, he went out and started to get sponsors. He then realized that the away from motivation meant that the the doubt or the worry of not doing the half marathon was worse than upsetting his friends. So therefore, he actually did it because he's away from motivation, because he didn't want to let his friends down having got sponsorship. It was driving him to that goal. It still made him do the half marathon, but it, personally, I think towards is stronger, a better motivation. But goals, motivation, and chunking them down are very important. People say, what is in the zone? What does in the zone mean? And there's certain definitions of being what we call in the zone. One, if you want to achieve something, be in the moment and have triggers. So it could be, triggers could be, I'm going to walk up here today, if there's a stage perhaps, pick up the water, have a sip, pick up my clicker, I'll be nearly ready to go. So the triggers, I'm breaking it down into thoughts in my mind so I start to imagine what it's going to be like. So to get into any zone where you want to achieve something, have triggers and think about yourself. Don't be distracted by other people. This is your moment. Whatever you want to do, think about yourself and park distractions. If ever you watch people, let me think. 100 meter sprinters, Olympic World Cup, Olympic Games final. When you used to watch athletes there, when you watch athletes there, they are on the line, they are just so focused. All they're looking at is the finish, the vision, the picture, going through a routine, going through triggers. So park distractions and focus on all of your achievements. They will be many. Remember that what I said, 95, 5%, 95%, great, 5% uh, poor, 
What do we focus on? The 5%. Focus on your achievements and have one simple objective. Don't overanalyze either. Don't overanalyze. Annie left at CBA. I think in modern terms, CBA has different connotations sometimes. But for this, whatever you're trying to achieve, conceive the project, believe, and then activate it. It's a bit like going back to goals. We have people who are sometimes dreamers. They have all these ideas, but they don't sit down to become doers. And they don't also then become disciplined when they set goals. You have to see this through. We all have choices in life. You don't have to pay your taxes, by the way, but there's an effect. If you don't pay your taxes, something will happen. So you can do anything you wish, but always remember there'll be a consequence. So when I say we all have choices, it's up to you what you want to achieve. This lady here, Wilma Rudolph, was born into a very impoverished black American family. She was born three months premature, and by the age of two or three, she had cholera too. By the age of one or two, she had to wear a knee, a knee brace. She had seven or eight brothers, so there's about 10 siblings in the family, nine, 10 siblings in the family. She decided when she got to four or five to take her knee brace off. People said to her, Wilma, it's not going to work, you know, just accept your lot in life. Conditioning, remember? Self-talk. She decided to take the knee brace off and she started to walk. At first the walking was a little bit awkward, but she walked a bit more smoothly. Fast forward to 12 or 13, she said, I'm going to run, try running. People said, Wilma, don't do it, it's not going to work. You're walking now, it's beyond what people thought you could do, don't do it. So she started to run again, a little bit awkward at first, but she started to get better and better. She then got to 17 or 18 and she entered the race. People said, Wilma, don't enter the race. It's not gonna work. You know, you're, you're doing great so far. It's not gonna work. She came near the back, not last, but very near the back. After that, she never lost the race again. And if you Google her, she won three gold medals in the able-bodied Olympic games. Go back to when she had the knee brace, go back when she couldn't walk, go back to when she was told not to run, go back to when she was told not to race. Had she listened to all of that, she wouldn't be running, she wouldn't be racing, she wouldn't be an Olympic champion because she didn't listen to what other people thought was right. She, it's back to our conditioning, our self-talk, remember? 70,000 thoughts a day. We can't exceed our own belief systems, our perceptions of reality. Whatever we believe the limits of our, our ability, that will be it. You can't outperform your own belief systems in terms of the limits of your own ability. So it's always so important to talk to yourself in a great way. Would you accept people come up to you and say, uh, can you do that PowerPoint present? Don't worry, you, you're lousy at PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. If people spoke to you like that, what would you do? You wouldn't, would you? Oh, I hope I haven't hit a raw nerve, by the way, there. But, you wouldn't accept people telling you what you couldn't do, but we tell ourselves it so many times and we're in control of ourselves and yet we tell ourselves all these things. Build some more helpful neuro pathways. They're the dendrites, positive dendrites, negative dendrites. The positive thoughts flow through the positive dendrites, negative, the negative, use the positives more. Our belief systems are driven. Have a success system as well. So hindering to helpful, our thinking and behaviors, Forget hindering. We can sometimes learn from failure or etc. But remember, forget the hindering, move to helpful. Start to use affirmations. Create positive word pictures of ourselves because the mind works in pictures. If you can picture it, they say, you can do it. Once you can picture something, you can do it. That is what science tells us. The trouble is we don't picture ourselves doing it. That's the key. Visioning as well, almost like affirmations, that picture in your own mind. And ultimately, we have to make choices and take personal responsibility for success. Gandhi had a saying, do not let your dirty feet walk through my mind. Don't be influenced by what people tell you you can't do. A 
another th two other things I'll say just before I finish. Smiling makes a massive difference, a massive difference. And I'll give you two examples. Two true stories, these, by the way. A group of people went to a comedy store one night, and when they went in, they were given an object, all of them together. The first object created a bit of a scowl. The way it's put into the mouth, that's the one. Can you come up and model that? A scowl. So they went to see this comedian. They come out afterwards. People say, the interview, what did you think of the comedian? Was he any good? The answer, he was all right. Not the best I've seen, but I'd give him four or five out of ten. You know, middle of the road if that. Okay, thanks. They go back a month later. Same comedian, same gags. This time, the instrument creates a smile. They come out, exactly the same comedian, exactly the same jokes. What do you think of the comedian? He's pretty good, actually. I quite liked him. Yeah, I'd give him eight out of ten. I'd come back and see him again. He's really good. The jokes were the same. The comedian's the same. The only difference was they smiled. They smiled and it made a difference to how they felt about life, themselves, him, everything. And I mentioned at the start, yet as well. Because yet is a very powerful word. So when people say to you, have you ever done such and such? Have you done such and such? No, no. Try saying, not yet. Because who knows what you can't or can do? Who knows what you can do in the future? They actually say, if the mind is powerful enough, you can achieve anything goes back to those 10,000 hours, doesn't it, really? Science now says that if you want something enough, 10,000 hours is the magic number. I still don't think I'll lock myself in the bedroom and play dark for 10,000 hours, but I still believe if I did, I could, or be world class. I still believe that, I really do. So in summary, we have potential beyond our belief. The choice is ours, and it goes back to the three Ds a bit, when you want to do something. You can be a dreamer, you can be a doer, you can take action, and you can be disciplined. But if your goals are powerful enough, there's nothing to stop you achieving those things. And I guess the question is, when do you want to start? Thank you very much. You've been an excellent yeah. audience. Thank you.